Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. This is John Holland, Chief Development Officer of Pynchon, calling from Vancouver. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar today, sharing lessons learned on infection control strategies with nonprofit organizations. This is uh, part of a, our practice innovation series where we're taking lessons learned from the current pandemic and our practice generally, uh, particularly with regard to infection control and building reoccupancy and sharing it with our broader community. Um, a bit of background, Pynchon have embedded corporate social responsibility into our value process. And that involves community outreach, sustainable practice, and environmentally focused practice. And we hope by sharing these lessons with you that we can help share those lessons with the not-for-profit sector and the broad community, and hopefully come up with a safer, more diligent uh, of continued occupancy and reoccupancy of our buildings. Um, there will be scope for questions in this webinar uh, during and at the end. And um, we'd like to thank you all for attending and being part of this process. Next slide, please. So a few uh, Zoom tools, and I think we're all depressingly familiar with Zoom these days, uh, get comfortable. Um, audio volume, if you could raise your hands on the uh, Zoom uh, menu bar at the bottom, just to show that we are audible, you can hear us. Uh, the chat function is for technical issues, if you can't hear us or can't connect. The Q&A is for technical questions you'd like to answer based on the presenter's presentation. We won't be doing any polling today. Uh, with that, I'd like to go to the next slide, please, Kaylee. So I'd like to present our speakers. We have three speakers today, all from Pynchon. David News and Shauna McIntyre from Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, all that area, and David Gardner from uh, the Toronto area. Uh, David News is our national practice leader with the Indoor Environmental Quality Group of Pynchon. Uh, he's based in Dartmouth. He holds a diploma in mineral technology and business administration from University College Cape Breton. David's a certified occupational hygiene technologist with over 25 years of experience involving, involving indoor air quality, environmental health and safety, and uh, mold and infection control in healthcare. He's worked for government, private, and construction sector clients, and he's a national practice leader of our indoor environmental group, focusing on technical performance of the team. Sean McIntyre, also from, from uh, Dartmouth, is an operations manager with our indoor environmental quality group in, in Dartmouth, Territory of the Maritimes. She has a bachelor's degree in environmental engineering from Dalhousie and a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of College of Cape Breton in Sydney. Uh, she works with, she's an engineer with Engineers Nova Scotia and Engineers PEI. She's also a certified national radar measurement provider and mitigator through the CNRPP. And Sean has been involved with a diverse range of air quality and occupational hygiene issues throughout her career. And the final speaker is David Gardner, who is our, also our National um, Occupational Health and Safety Practice Leader at Pynchon, where he, has a, he also has a Master's of Science in Health Sciences from the University of Waterloo, and a Master's of Chemical Engineering, focusing on occupational hygiene from the University of Toronto, and a Master's of Business Administration, three MBAs. He's also a registered occupational hygienist, with the C and he's a CRSP, Canadian Registered Certified Professional, uh, Registered Professional. Um, and he has worked extensively uh, across the country in health and safety and industrial hygiene issues. And he's also going to be sharing his lessons with you. Uh, there will be a survey at the end, uh, mostly to uh, gauge our engagement and make sure we're giving our community the things they want to see from these webinars. If you have questions, by all means, ask them during the session, ask them at the end. Or if you feel more comfortable, put those comments in your in the questionnaire that we use to recalibrate these for the future. And if you want to find more about Pynchon's uh, outreach through our CSR program, as not for profits, where we try to help you in your mission, please feel free to reach out to myself. Uh, my contact details are jholland at pynchon.com. Thank you. And with that, I will hand the uh, podium metaphorically over to David. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I appreciate the, the introduction. So what we're here to talk about this afternoon, uh, my part of the talk anyway, is under occupied buildings and risks to remember. Um, we've been all, uh, well, we'll just jump into the, the, some of the next slide, please, Kaylee. 
So we got some session goals that we are going to want to try to to cover as we go through this. So we're going to discuss from an environmental perspective how buildings may have been affected from reduced COVID capacity or reduced capacity during COVID. The first question we want to ask is why do we even care that uh, uh, about whether or not a building uh, with reduced capacity is is okay? Um, is Legionella a risk in these buildings? At system startup your HVAC and your water, is there, is there a risk when we start those systems back up? And is mold a risk when we move back into our buildings? So the next slide, Kaylee. Finally, we're gonna put uh, all the questioning aside and answer this question. Is there any difference between a mask and a respirator? It's been a, a debate that's been going on. And are we being protected with, with both? Next slide, please, Kaylee. So let's answer this question. Why should we care? You know, we've all heard the conspiracy theories over the past 14 months, you know, that maybe this is all much to do about nothing. Uh, the government is conspiratizing, uh, all these kinds of things. There, with so much information out there, um, we've been bombarded by these questions over the last months. Um, so it's, often hard to know where we should hang our hat and, and, and who we should listen to and who we should believe. COVID's gonna be here for a while yet. I think we've seen that, um, it's quite clear. And I think people need to see, um, one of the things people need to see, see now is normal and, and I'm, we're not really sure what this normal is gonna be. But I think part of this normal is, is for people to start getting back into their workplaces, um, whether it's industry or, or office buildings or some kind of commercial or setting. Um, we need to get back and sort of feel that normal. That's gonna be good for our mental health, peace of mind. And uh, with all that is gonna um, increase our productivity. Next slide, please. So why should we care? Um, here's a few reasons why we should care. First is transmission risks are still out there, especially with the new virus that are that are on, on the go now. Um, we still talk about high risk being um, droplets, the, the droplets coming out of speaking moistly for sure. The direct contact piece is something that's under, uh, a, there's a lot of science going into that now wondering um, if, if that is in fact as much of a risk as it, as it was in the beginning. Um, medium risk, indirect contact and some low risk activities. Um, Right now, the authorities are still calling that uh, like airborne and fecal and oral. Next slide, please. So how do we know that it's safe to reoccupy a building? You know, I think we probably have established in the first few slides that we, we probably do care um, about why about we do care about getting back into buildings and that we should do it safely but how do we get back and how do we work safely how do we get back in the buildings and know that they're safe you know what does it even look like the science is changing so much with regard to the the variants or the big things now that we're hearing about um so with all this information that's being bombarded at us um i think the very first thing that we need to do is we have to come up with a plan so we can change the slide. Um, so the plan is as simple as, as, as these three things. We need to evaluate the risk in a building, um, a risk, the exposure risks to, to COVID. If we find that there are risks, potential risks of exposure, then we have to come up with solutions to mitigate or to, to reduce those risks. And then the other part that's extremely important is the communication. How do we communicate those risks and solutions to, to uh, users of the space? Now, um, one really important part of developing any kind of a plan, especially during COVID times, is that plan, that plan needs to be extremely flexible. We wanna be able to turn the plan on a dime and go in a different direction. And a good example of that is, is what happened here in Nova Scotia. Uh, just yesterday, um, prior to yesterday, 
um, we were traveling along really nicely with our, our COVID um, stats and, and, and whatnot. And all our bars and restaurants were open. Um, our our uh, 100% capacity in gyms and retail and things like that. The premier came on the radio yesterday and said, all restaurants are closed. There's no, uh, all the gyms are closed, retail at 25% now. And all these restrictions came on us like in, in a matter of, of 24 hours. So anybody who had a plan are going to have to switch that plan on a dime and, and, and react to, to the new information that was out there. So it's very important that these plans are flexible. Next slide, Kaylee. Um, it's important to realize that sometimes the risks are perceived and sometimes they're real. Um, you know, we, we all heard, we all know about the, the real risks of COVID out there. Uh, we've been hearing about them all the time. But there's also the perceived risks. There's also the emotional side of this. And, and we can't let that get away from us because um, all those emotions are real. And we have to, as part of our plans, we have to be able to, to address, uh, address that because the, the, um, they're not going to go away either. People are going to be, whether or not it's justifiable or not, people are going to be afraid to come back into buildings, come back into spaces, come back. Um, into shopping malls and things like that. So, so we, we definitely have to address those in plans. Next slide, please. So what's the difference between an under-occupied and an unoccupied building? That, uh, that we, we do have to make that distinction because I think in the beginning of COVID, we had a lot of unoccupied buildings. Now I think we're going into the direction of there's a lot of people coming back or have been coming back over the last number of months. So we have more under-occupied buildings. So I don't know if we're, or we're a long time away from getting back to that photo on the right, um, I'm sure. But hopefully we're not gonna see for much longer that photo on the left. Probably what we're gonna see is, is what this next slide is. So most we're going to be in between and in, in that under-occupied space. And what does under-occupied mean? How much under-occupation is safe and how much isn't? Um, there's a lot of science that's going into that right now. Um, but what we do know is something, next slide, please. Um, the CDC, Center for Disease Control in, in the States, um, they've, they break hazards when, when they talk about reoccupying buildings um, after COVID. They talk about three categories of hazards that we should be aware of. One is mold, one is Legionella, and one is lead and copper. And we're going to talk about each of these individually. So mold, um, is it lurking in hidden spaces? I guess the the biggest thing I think you should remember about, about the mold part of this is if we are leaving pieces of buildings, a wing of a building or a building itself unoccupied for a long period of time and we're not spending time in those spaces, we're not inspecting it, we're not. Um, if there is a, an opportunity for, wa for a, a water infiltration event um, and we're not seeing it, we run the risk of the, the problem getting worse. So if there's a, um, click to the next slide, please. If there's a roof leak, um, this is a pretty classy one, classic one. Um, if that goes unnoticed, it could get worse and worse. Next slide, please. We'll run through these next few pretty quick. Plumbing leak is another one. And especially if the plumbing leak is small, um, it could build and build and you get a, a big mess unless you're looking at it from a regular basis. That, Picture on the right-hand side, the condensation on a window. That's a telltale that you're probably going to get mold, but if we're not around to see that, we, we may not uh, pick it up. Um, and uh, just other types of mold, too. You can flip through that, Kaylee. And even the next one. So that's, that's a, a little bit about mold. 
what we want to talk about now is water quality. Should we be testing for Legionella or other things? So I'm going to let Shauna McIntyre um, talk to you about this. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so we're going to start with just a little bit of a background on what uh, Legionella is and why it is now a concern, more so with these under-occupied buildings. So we'll go through that. Um, thank you, Kaylee. So uh, where did um, Legionnaire's disease come from? So back in 1976, the uh, American Legion Association held a convention in Philadelphia at a hotel. Shortly following this convention, the, uh, some, a lot of the uh, occupants of the hotel started um, going and getting tested because they were having these uh, respiratory uh, problems that included headaches, high fever, difficulty breathing. 35% um, of them were hospitalized and it resulted in 34 deaths. So because of this unusual respiratory illness, the uh, Center for Disease Control came in and investigated. And following their investigation, they identified a bacteria and they named it after the American Legion, Legionella pneumophilia. And they identified this as the cause of this respiratory illness. Then they had to do further investigation to figure out why did these people have it? And the one common thread among all of the people that attended this convention was this hotel. And they linked it back to the uh, hotel's cooling tower. Next slide, please. So what is Legionnaire's disease? It is a bacterial pneumonia caused by the Legionella pneumophilia uh, bacteria. It is caused by inhalation of aerosols containing the Legionella bacteria. So it's not so much so the consumption of this bacteria, but it's breathing in airborne droplets that contain the bacteria that can then get into our lungs. The disease develops within two to 10 days of exposure, and you're gonna develop flu-like sym symptoms, chest pains, high fever, could develop into pneumonia, and in some cases it could lead to death. It can be treated, especially if it is caught early enough. Next slide, please. It has a fatal fatality rate of approximately 10 to 15 percent. It is a Legionella is not something that is contagious, unlike COVID. So if you're near someone that has Legionella, you're not going to be able to contract the illness from them, you have to breathe in the airborne droplets that contain the bacteria. Uh, every year in the US, there are about 6,000 Legionnaires disease cases that are reported. The most recent US population-based study estimated that there are about eight to 18,000 that are hospitalized each year with Legionnaires disease. Uh, because patients uh, with Pontiac fever usually get better on their own, cases may not be routinely recognized or reported. And Pontiac fever is also caused by the same bacteria, but it doesn't develop into um, as severe of a case of the disease and has a much less uh, fatality rate. Most people will just develop a few flu-like symptoms, not even realizing that it's anything different than a typical flu. So a lot of times the Pontiac fever does not get diagnosed because people are not going to seek treatment and diagnosis for that. Next slide, please. So what are some of the risk factors? So just like anything, especially uh, we're a bit more familiar with um, risk factors such as with COVID, who is gonna be more prone to developing more severe symptoms and who's gonna be more prone to maybe being in that fatality uh, percentage. So alcohol, so if you have a high alcohol consumption, uh, those people are more likely to develop more severe symptoms. Uh, cigarette smoking or any type of uh, smoking, vaping, any of that, that can impede um, your respiratory uh, control, then that's, they're going to be more susceptible. The elderly, anyone that has uh, respiratory conditions, uh, including asthma, they're going to be more susceptible and develop more uh, intense symptoms. Next slide, please. So the roots of exposure. So as I mentioned, it's not something that 
you know, if we consume it, we're not going to be developing this illness. What we have to do is the route of exposure is through breathing it in. So contaminated water presents the greatest risk and when it becomes airborne and aerosolized. And what we're looking at is the size of these, of these airborne droplets that we're breathing in. And the ideal size um, for the bacteria to enter our bodies is in the one to five micrometer range because this size can be in, inhaled as an aerosol deeply into our lungs. So just for a perspective on what that size is, we have a, this diagram here shows a human hair, which is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter. A grain of sand is about 90 microns in diameter. Uh, PM10, which are airborne particulates, which are 10 microns in diameter, and they include uh, things like dust, pollen, or mold and uh, airborne particulates 2.5, which are usually what you see, hear a lot about in the news when we're talking about ambient air quality. And those include combustion particles, organic compounds, and metals. So you can see the size difference, and we're in the one to five micrometers. So we'll be at, some could be smaller than the 2.5, and double that size. So that's the size, that's how small they are. And you can see the three of those will fit on the one uh, PM10. So it's quite small particles that we're concerned with here. Reason for that is, is the smaller the particle, the more easily that particle can bypass all of our own body's natural defenses that we have for when we're trying to, um, when we breathe in, our nose hairs, our mucous membrane, all of that stuff, it's able to bypass and get deep within our lungs. Next slide, please. So chain of transmission, we have a body of water. Legionella is a naturally occurring bacteria, so you're gonna find it in all of our natural sources of water. It, uh, so it's in our water supplies. It is then can be, if we contain it in a reservoir, and then that body of water in some type of reservoir that we're holding it in, then has a source that aerosolizes it. Becomes aerosolized, we can breathe it in and then become infected within our lungs. Next slide, please. Water temperature plays a huge role in, um, especially within our buildings in uh, developing this bacteria. The Legionella growth range is between 20 to 49 degrees Celsius. As the water temperature increases above 49 degrees Celsius, the growth is going to slow down um, because it's outside of its ideal growth range and it's going to, they're going to die off. Um, temperatures at above, above 70 degrees Celsius is going to instantly kill them. They will not survive above that temperature. The ideal growth range is between 30 degrees to 42 degrees Celsius. Next slide, please. Another thing that helps the bacteria grow within our water systems, within our buildings is biofilm. They are a huge contributor to outbreaks within buildings. The biofilm is like this thick slimy coating that can line the um, inside of our distribution pipes. And what it does is it acts as a protection barrier for the bacteria. They can grow and live inside this biofilm and the water going through the pipes is not gonna disturb it. However, there can be large quantities of the bacteria that can be released and disturbed all at once, especially if there's um, a source that can cause a pressure differential, such as turning off the water supply system, conducting some repairs and then restarting it up again. Um, this is particularly an issue on corroded surfaces, um, especially within our domestic and hot water, domestic hot and cold water systems. So another concern are dead legs. And the dead legs are a concern for two reasons. One is because you're gonna have this uh, stagnant water and the biofilm is going to be sitting there and it's gonna be able to grow and the bacteria are gonna be able to, uh, to live in there and be protected because we're not having the water flow to a source anymore. And that uh, could be for a number of reasons. It could be that there has that sink is no longer in use, so we, we've just not used it. And the big concern that is coming up because of COVID is this low use. So there's a number of sinks and faucets that are not being used, and we've kind of created uh, numerous dead legs within our buildings. The other concern with the dead legs, and it would be 
be depending on the season as well would be that this water can then it's not going to be as if it's a cold water system it's not going to be as cold because we don't have that water running through our buildings the way we normally would and maybe if it's um the hot water distribution lines it's not going to be as hot as we would like it to be because again we're not using it maybe we've also turned down a lot of people think by turning down their hot water tanks and they're being more energy efficient, but however, we could be turning it down to a temperature that makes it more ideal for the bacteria to grow. Next slide, please. Drinking water, uh, we also, so Legionella is a big concern with our, with our water systems, but we also don't wanna forget about other drinking water issues that can be related to stagnant water um, that can be developing within our dead legs. So lead and other metals, as well as other bacterial contaminations are also concerned when we have um, stagnant water sitting within our distribution lines. Next slide, please. So we've been getting a lot of questions recently with um, Legionella concerns. Some of them are, do I have Legionella bacteria in my building? Uh, there's always a potential if the lines haven't been flushed and maintenance hasn't been uh, maintained during these shutdown periods. My building has been vacant or had low occupancy due to the ongoing pandemic. What do I need to do? How do I flush my building? Do I need to do any testing? And what criteria do I compare the results to? Next slide, please. So there is flushing guidance out there. There are numerous documents out there that can help us in determining what should we be doing to keep our buildings running smoothly during this uh, occupancy to reduce this risk of uh, Legionella growth. Next slide, please. And there's many guidelines and standards, um, public works, um, American Industrial Hygiene Association. There's lots of them out there. Uh, next slide, please. And a few more, ASHRAE has some out there as well. Um, and for developing uh, management systems for um, decreasing our risk of this bacteria within our building's water systems. Next slide, please. So if you do decide to sample, to, just to assess, to see, you know, is there something in my water system? Is Legionella something I should be concerned about? Or is there a concern that I need to deal with? There is, you can do some sampling. Uh, so if you are doing sampling, we do have, there's many labs out there and our lab, we do have our laboratory in our Mississauga location and they do this analysis. And we can assist you with, with any of our offices in, um, providing sample bottles and how to do this because you want to make sure it's being sampled correctly and that you're getting it to a, a certified lab. So we're going to use sterile bottles. Uh, if you do have cooling towers, uh, 100 mils for uh, cooling towers and 500 mils for other samples. We're going to want to make sure that they're packed in insulated containers and coolers with freezer packs. We need to keep them cold during transport and that we're completing chain of custody, custody documents for the laboratories. And all samples have to be received at the laboratory within 48 hours of sample collection uh, due to the time restraints with the bacteria. Next slide, please. So uh, you wanna make sure that you're selecting a lab that is, has demonstrated skills on the environmental sample analysis, that they're ISO 17025 compliant, that they're accredited by the CDC, and that the laboratory is proactive and gives advanced notice for presence of high counts of Legionella. And that is something that our lab will do. So a lot of times, well not a lot of times, each time these sample results have to be cultured. And so they take, two weeks for analysis. But a lot of times the lab will be able to notice right away, especially if you have a high number of Legionella in your water, they'll know probably within, you know, maybe three to five days that there is a Legionella detection here. They might not be able to give you a final count, but they'll be able to say, we're detecting something here. And the sooner we know the better, because then we can start implementing some of those uh, mitigation techniques. Next slide, please. So in summary, do your due diligence, maintaining monitor building water systems. We didn't touch on it too much uh, with the cooling towers, except for at the beginning where it was linked back to that hotel, but 
a lot of people think if I don't have a cooling tower, I don't have to be concerned with um, Legionella, but it is basically all of our building water systems have the potential, especially uh, with the low occupancy rate and that the systems aren't being used the way they should be. Um, and sample and test your water systems for Legionella before reopening buildings, especially if, you, if we haven't been implementing some of those techniques um, all along. Next slide, please. Okay, and we're back to Dave, who was going to look at discussing some of our HVAC startup. Thank you very much, Shana. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's talk about HVAC for for a little bit here, and uh, and we can flip to the next slide, Kelly, please. So, HVAC and COVID. So, what we should be knowledgeable about when it comes to using a HVAC system to reduce the risk of COVID in our spaces. So we wanna talk a little bit about drafts, about filtration, relative humidity, some air exchange and maintenance. So let's start with, an, with this slide here and see what ASHRAE says about it. Um, ASHRAE, I mentioned earlier that, you know, who, who do we hang our hats on for, for really solid information about how to, how to find our way through these times and Center for Disease Control for sure in the US um, the WHO for sure, Health Canada, all good sources. And from a ventilation standpoint, ASHRAE um, has given a lot of good information. So what, what are, what is ASHRAE saying? ASHRAE says HVAC filters along with other strategies help to reduce virus transmission while removing other contaminants from the air. So they're saying that, that, uh, using, using, uh, the HVAC system with the proper filters is is a way to reduce the amount of COVID in the air. Next, next, please. So poor ventilation, and here's a it, just a, a a quick illustration of poor ventilation and high infection rates. The picture on your left there, there's all kinds of good ventilation. You can see the air coming in from the top, the blue arrow, and it's spreading uh, across the face of that one person and it's being exhausted with the reddish brown arrow out to the right. Now you can see the person on the right, they're they're speaking moistly and a lot of what a lot of the uh, the droplets with the, that are contained where the virus is contained in aren't getting into the breathing zone of the other person. Now in the next picture, the one that's on the right, um, the opposite is happening. There's no ventilation in there. So the room isn't getting any air exchange at all. And that's the most important part is, is changing the air in that room. The more often you can change the air in that room with your ventilation system, the, uh, the, the less contaminant that's gonna be in the air. Next slide, Haley, please. So why are drafts important? Um, this was a, a a study that that came out re near the first part of COVID, and it, it's a restaurant in in China. And when you look at C1 and C2, both of those people in the restaurant had COVID. And because of the air conditioning system that was right behind them, we all heard of the six foot rule and the the, the two meter rule. When you know. All those bets are off now that the air conditioning is behind them because that's moving air across to table A and then eventually to table B. And interesting, no, nobody from E and F um, contracted the virus because the air conditioning system and the draft was moving, moving it away. Next slide, Haley, please. Um, so how does it, you know, what's that mean for us? Well, we all see this. We have desks and, and tabletops that have our, uh, our fans on, small fans like this. Well, what that fan is doing is that's taking the air, concentrated air, concentrating the air in the room and bringing it into a small space and uh, dumping it in, uh, into, the, uh, in, into the breathing zone of the person who would be sitting at that chair. Um, the second one, top right, that's uh, 
something like we we saw in the restaurant but if this is a boardroom and the person sitting right under that air conditioner has covid even if you got your six foot distance and you have somebody sitting on the other end of the table there's potential for that person to contract it as well and then the the photo on the bottom is we need one way to combat these drafts and air moving um, to carry to carry the the virus is have our ventilation systems properly balanced. I see a lot of times when I go into situations where there's a piece of uh, an air diffuser that's covered because it's and yeah, I ask the question that they say it's because it's too drafty. So if you get a situation where there's a, a higher velocity of air blowing onto a person. If that person has COVID, um, that could be picked up and, and carried elsewhere. Next slide, please, Kayla. Um, so ASHRAE states, when they talk about filtration, um, to upgrade filters to a MERV 13 or better if possible. If not, then the highest MERV rating in this system, the system can handle. Because not all, ventilation systems were designed to handle a MERV-13, but what they're saying, that is, that is the ideal. Next, please. So when it comes back to, to uh, some kind of preventative maintenance or maintenance on your ventilation system, if you're leaving it, um, if it's shut off or, or, or you're not, because nobody's in the building or there's not many people in the building, you're not doing as much inspection uh, as you were before. You could have situations that look like this. The one on the right is obvious. There's a, the, the filter has gone through and, and there's a small gap on the one on the left. And what, what is happening there is unfiltered air is getting back and trained into your, into your uh, supply air system. So if there is somebody in your space that does have COVID or if there's other contaminants, it doesn't even necessarily have to be COVID. It could be mold or, or, or something else. It's not getting filtered out at the, at the filtration piece. So the only way to catch this is if you're inspecting it and, uh, and looking at it. Next one, please, Kaylee. Um, so relative humidity also plays an important role or can play an important role in the transmission of COVID as well. Um, ideally, you want your levels between 40 and 60%. Um, couple of reasons. One reason is, is that's where our lungs function the best when we have 40 to 60%. And since this is a respiratory um, problem, we, uh, that gives us the best chance of not contracting it. But the other part of it is, is when we speak moistly or we cough and we got the, the nuclei, the viruses inside these um, droplets, if the air is too dry in a space, what can happen is the droplet will evaporate right away and all you're left is, with is the nuclei. And because that's a lot smaller and a lot lighter, it can, it can move a lot farther in distance with just normal air currents in the building. So, Having a relative humidity um, regulated is, is important as well. Next slide, please, Kim. And uh, I'm gonna just finish off with this slide here. Um, the preventive maintenance program, it's always important to have that in your buildings. Um, during these times, uh, COVID times, if you only got 20% capacity in your building, or maybe there's nobody in your building, um, it doesn't have to be as robust as it was uh, when you're at 100% capacity. But at a minimum, some of the things that we talked about here, the your water systems for Legionella and your ventilation systems and, and just looking around to make sure that there isn't um, water leaks or, or mold in your buildings. It's important that we're, we're making some kind of effort on a regular basis to, uh, to look at that. Next slide, Kayla. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. David Gardner right now, and he's gonna to talk to you about when a mask is. Good 
I can everyone hear me? I can't turn my camera back on. <laughs> we can hear you, David. Anyways, okay. Well, I'll start off. It's not necessary that you, you see me because I have control of the slides and for some reason I can't turn my camera on, but neither here nor there. So what I'm going to talk about is really um, the value of wearing masks and the comparison to respirators and try and give you, as you've seen from the beginning introductions, that I am an occupational hygienist and had you know extensive specialized training in respiratory protection and over 30 years of experience. And uh, what I want to do is share that with you so that you can understand essentially the bottom line to me is why we should be wearing masks and where wearing anything is going to provide some protection. Uh, we, what we need to understand is what the risks are. And so that we, we know what we're trying to control and we understand it and we can use the right protection. So why didn't we start wearing masks in the beginning? Uh, as I understand it, there was some, some apprehension on the, on the part of people like Dr. Tam to recommend that we wear masks in the beginning. And one of them revolved around the fact that they didn't want the public and companies to, to run on and consume and buy all the uh, respirators and, and certified um, face medical masks uh, because they knew they would need it for the, uh, the for the medical facilities to use, and that's one of the reasons that they uh, uh, that, as I understand it, was one of the reasons why they didn't make those recommendations. And the other was had to do with something that I understand as an occupational hygienist. If you if you're not wearing a respirator properly, or if you're you know it's you're wearing a mask, there, there's opportunities as you breathe in for air to be drawn in and leaked through areas where these, these can leak. And there's, you know, there's a real concern about trying to tell people that, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're getting protection and, and, and an occupational hygienist would stand up and say, no, you're not getting protected because you're getting leakage, but that's really is not uh, all the true facts. So there's lots of misinformation out there and this is what I'm trying to dispel today for you. And one of them is I was reading an article and they're talking about uh, the fact that like an N95 respirator, what that means, it filters out 95% um, of all the particles that are have a size of 0.3 microns. And all that is is the testing method that they use to test those respirators. So this article in this very large newspaper in the US went on to say, well, this means that your respirators won't even stop viruses from getting into your breathing area. Uh, even though you're wearing a respirator, and that is wholly untrue, because they don't really understand that all they're doing, all the testing method is, is this is how we're testing it, and we don't know what percentage of those viruses are going to get picked up from, but I, I can tell you that those, those respirators will pick up viruses, and the other thing you have to understand, as David was talking about, is that we're really mostly talking about droplets of water with, with viruses in it and pricking up. And they're much larger than 0.3 microns in, in very many cases. So again, there's, there's, there's so much information out there and it's so confusing. And again, this is what I'm trying to dispel some of that, uh, some of that aspect of it. No, I am not able to change this. Okay. Coming up very slow. So where did the one to two meter rule come from? Well, we'll actually find out that it goes back um, many years, uh, but understand a couple of things. Uh, one is we had this previous um, virus, uh, which was called, everyone called SARS. And SARS co-virus co one, was the cause of that virus. And that was way back in 2003. And I remember hearing about um, the, the recommendations about, they actually started at one meter and then it went to two meters and saying that, you know, nurses and doctors should be wearing their, their surgical masks essentially, and that's gonna protect them. And as a hygienist, I went, well, that doesn't sound right because, you know, you're gonna get leakage. You're gonna, not, you're gonna be drawing in um, things that are in the air. But I, so I, so I, I did the right thing. I went to the, the actual sources. I went to Health Canada. I looked up the recommendations 
And what they were trying to protect nurses and doctors from was really not just the airborne levels, but they were protecting them from people coughing and sneezing and essentially projectile um, droplets coming at them. And the, the basic theory is that if, if you were outside of that two meter area, you actually didn't require any protection at all because um, the, you know, the virus didn't spread far enough in those droplets, they would drop, they would dry and drop to the ground. And if you're outside of the area, you, you had a fairly low risk. And now we know with, with COVID-2, which we're dealing with now, which is a virus that causes COVID, which is SARS um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, co-virus 2 causes um, the COVID uh, condition. We know that it, it seems like it can go a little further and now these variants are obviously creating a lot of, uh, of issues. And so, I just have to click my thoughts for a second. So um, it, it did turn out that these masks do protect people. And this is very important because um, we want to make sure that people are protected and they understand the risk they're protecting from. And recognize that surgical masks, as we'll talk about, are originally were designed to protect you if you were a patient. If you're in surgery, they wanted to make sure that the doctor wasn't breathing on you and and, and contaminating, you know, you're, when you're being very vulnerable. And that was the real purpose of it, but that also provided some protection for doctors. So if we go back as far as 1897, uh, way back in 1897, Flug did some studies and, and Flug decided that uh, one to two meters uh, was a safe distance to be away from someone who's uh, coughing or you know, you know, essentially emitting these uh, droplets into the air. So, I mean, this goes back a long ways. And this has been reaffirmed by CDC. And so that, you know, this is a relatively good distance, but, you know, as our common practices are, even if you're not within two meters of somebody, our advice really is that you should be wearing uh, a face mask to protect yourself. Okay. I guess, Kaylee, you're changing these slides for me because I cannot get them to move. I will take control. You just tell me when to, to when to advance. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. It was uh, best laid plans. <laughs> you should have control of that again, Kaylee. Okay. I need to zoom myself ahead here. So. It's very important that you can see the, the difference here. This is what hygienists are talking about. Good old Ned Flanders over there. And I'm not, I'm not really a Simpsons fan, but of course everyone must know about the, the longest running show in television history. But, you know, he's wearing protection and he's got a proper respirator on to protect himself. And of course, you know, uh, Homer on the other side is spraying and he's just covered him, his, himself with a, with a face mask. So what we have to understand is respirators are designed to protect us, it, the wearer of the, of the respirator. And, but what you have to recognize with most respirators, they have exhalation valves on, him, on them. <laughs> so what that means is when you breathe out, you're breathing air out. And of course, if there's any viruses that you're breathing out, you're gonna be breathing that out. So respirators technically, uh, for the most part, except for those, you know, those lovely N95 white respirators, that actually protect you and protect the uh, people around you. Uh, there is some lack of protection there, even though it, it is fair to say you're gonna be knocking down most of uh, what you're breathing out, even though that exhalation valve is there. And masks, as I said, on the other side are really to protect the people around you, as I said, when you're, do, when you're involved in surgery, but recognize that despite the leakage, despite the uh, exhalation valves, both these things will provide protection for you and for, the, for those around you. And that's the whole purpose of wearing these masks. So just to give you an idea of uh, some of the things that, uh, and sorry, not quite yet. <laughs> um, there's been some recent studies and David pointed that out quite clearly. There's lots of research going on about COVID. So they did some studies and just to give you an idea because what is the most important thing to protect yourself is to reduce the number of viruses you're exposed to. And the, the stuff I'm reading is saying, you know, it's not like one virus you inhale is going to, going to make you sick. 
it's going to take thousands, if not more, of these viruses to actually defeat your body's uh, uh, defense systems. And so they did, they've done some work and so, so breathing normally, uh, they figured out you breathe out about 4.9, which is about five, obviously, five viruses per cubic meter of air. So this is a, a space of air that's one, cube, one meter by one meter by one meter. When you cough, a single cough produces 277,000 viruses that you're breathing out. So a vast big difference. And so just recognize that wearing a, a mask and you happen to be coughing or sneezing, you're gonna be knocking a lot of that down depending on how effective your, your mask is. And this is why, as you can tell, they, they got in to say, you know, your mask should have two layers in it. It's better if it's three. It, you know, it should be made of a certain material because if it, if it has too many holes essentially and it, it's not gonna provide as much protection and the more we can knock down these, these coughs and sneezes and just breathing out, the better we are. When they looked at people who, are, who have COVID um, and they're coughing and sneezing repeatedly, the numbers go as high, and these are just average numbers, the 7.4 million viruses being released by a high emitter. And when those people that have COVID breathe out, as opposed to 4.9, they're actually breathing out an average of 1,248 viruses every time they breathe. So again, the more you can, by wearing a mask, you're gonna be reducing those uh, exhalation numbers. By wearing a mask, you're gonna be reducing how much of that you're, you're taking into your own system. So these are all good things. So yeah, go to the next, uh, the next picture there, Kaylee. So, you know, some humorous pictures that, you know, we use when we talk about respiratory protection, but, you know, people who don't have the devices they need understand some of the risks. And, you know, so you know, this person knows that there's something he's not being exposed to. And of course, he's not getting perfect protection, but he's getting some, just like the person in the next picture. So this person, you know, he's probably more concerned about buying getting hit by flying bits of concrete, but he's getting some level of protection even while wearing that. Of course, it's not perfect. And of course, occupational hygienists and safety professionals would just kind of laugh at these pictures, but we are getting some protection. And again, this is the bottom line behind wearing masks is we do get some protection. Okay, next slide. And you can zoom in the next picture. So this is our KN95 uh, that comes out of Korea. And you can see it has these ear loops on it. And I can tell you when we do quantitative fit testing, we have a very, very difficult time getting proper fits for these types of respirators. And they're not nearly as good as the N95s that are approved by NIOSH. So uh, next, um, click ahead. So, uh, so Health Canada came out and warned about this saying, you know, these respirators, because they can't meet these, the more stringent standards in, in North America, should be really considered to just be face masks and not respirators. Again, there's, there's a difference, right? Respirators protect you and masks fundamentally protect others. So this is uh, something where they can't confirm that, that the, these KN95s are gonna protect you. I'm gonna tell you in my opinion that you will get some protection from them. And it's probably gonna be better than, you know, putting a, a, um, some other, uh, even a, a surgical face mask over it because you're gonna get a better seal. But what you need to go to is uh, the next uh, click there, Kelly, is these beautiful N95s. Um, and I'll show you later essentially how to wear them properly. So these are NIOSH approved. You will see on here, if you look closely, there is a TC number under that and it has, says NIOSH on it. And that gives you comfort that these respirators were tested under proper conditions. But if you can't confirm that you've, you've had this then you really don't know what kind of protection you're getting. Okay, next slide. So, as you can tell, you know, you pull your shirt over and this is a very common strategy for some people. And I'm not saying you're not getting some protection, but 
uh, these types of materials don't have the aerosol knocking down ability that you're going to get from wearing a surgical face mask or other ones that you know are double, triple layered and made of cotton and all the other recommendations that are coming out. Next slide, Kaylee. So really what it's all about is understanding the risks and this, so you're, what you're trying to protect yourself from, the risk in this case is being exposed to more and more viruses and the lower we can keep that count down to, the less chance we're going to contract the disease. And, and then we have to pick the right management strategy for dealing with that. Next slide. And the next picture. So here's your different levels of protection and I'm gonna you know, give you a little more uh, information about respirators. So the very first picture is our, you know, our classic N95 respirator. And again, it's design says it will give you 95% protection against uh, particle sizes that are 0.3. That, again, that's just the method they use for testing it. So that's all they can really say about it. And again, it, it protects you if it's worn properly and it protects other people around you because it is filtering the air. Of course, it's not perfect. The second one we have there is a typical half face respirator and it has some nice uh, purple filters on it. And these respirators actually provide 99.97% protection against particles at 0.3 microns. So this is really the highest level of protection for what I would call a half piece, half piece respirator. And of course you, you may be familiar, you can get full face respirators and if you get properly tested on those, then they can provide even more protection, but that is the, the highest level. And then the next one we see is these surgical masks. And what's important is there a dip, there's a difference between you going to the local pharmacy and buying a surgical mask and one that is used by the medical fraternity because they use respirators uh, that are rated by ASTM, which is the, uh, the American Society for Testing and Materials, and they actually have uh, class one, two, and three, or sorry, level one, two, and three medical masks. So these things are actually certified to provide protection for you as a patient and for pr providing some protection for the doctors. So if, if you're not buying one that meets that requirement, then you're not getting as good a protection as, as certainly doctors and nurses are getting. And of course, last on the list is our face covering. And this is a you know a pretty good one, but it's not going to provide the protection of the other three. So next uh, picture. So here you can see it is very obvious if you're going to go and buy a respirator, whether it's NIOSH approved, it's going to say NIOSH on it, and it's going to have a TC uh, uh, number on there that's telling you this is the registration number. You can go to the NIOSH site, you can put in those numbers, and it will tell you whether it's actually a certified NIOSH respirator or not. If you, want it, if you want the best surgical uh, mask, then you need to have one that has an ASTM level three uh, registration on it. And that's what, that's what you're looking for. So they will provide better protection than just the generic ones that we buy from the local pharmacy if they're not ASTM certified. Next slide. So even wearing a respirator, you have to understand there are protection factors. And for that half feet, half face piece that we we're talking about in the previous slide, it has a, an, an assigned protection factor of 10, which means the concentration of what's outside is one tenth what's inside the respirator or vice versa. What's inside your respirator will be 10 times higher outside. Now we know from doing quantitative fit testing that you can, we actually see protection factors as high as a thousand or more. But what you have to understand is they rate these things as 10 because we know that pe when people wear respirators, they don't necessarily wear them properly. And so they have to derate the system somewhat. And there's, there's some other issues with why we're picking 10, but recognize even respirators don't provide 100% protection from anything. It's just not really possible. Next slide. So here's, a, here's a, a gentleman and he's got his N95 on and he's wearing it properly. And this is why the KN95s don't work properly because the loops only go around your ears 
and they really don't fit properly. And here, so the, the key things here is you have two bands. So if you go to a big box store and buy one of these um, painters masks, it'll have a single band on it. And I guarantee that single band um, face mask will not be NIOSH approved because you need both these straps. One goes around the crown at the top of your head and the other goes around your neck. Next picture. So when you do things like this or the next picture or do this, you're not getting the fit that, that you think you're getting. And that's, that's the issue is what protection do I think I'm getting? And that's what I'm trying to sell to you is you need to understand the risks and you need to understand how you're protecting yourself and how, so that you don't, one, you don't overestimate how it can protect you. And you also don't underestimate how it can protect you. Uh, next picture. So when is a mass just a mass? Um, to me, it's pretty simple when it's not NIOSH approved. Next picture. It's not ASTM approved. And the, la the last uh, main point really is uh, you're wearing a mass and you're not wearing it properly. That is when things don't work properly. So that's when a mass is just a mass is when you're not using it properly. But again, my, to me, the bottom line is uh, quite clear that you need to be wearing a uh, mask. Uh, it will provide protection despite what you see in, the, in some of the social media and other things out there. You know, as I talked about from the very beginning, well, if it's less than 0.3, you, you're not gonna be protected. That is, in my opinion, is not true. Um, really, so the more people that wear masks, just put, make, make it simply, you're breathing out less aerosols by wearing a mask, you're breathing in less aerosols, you're reducing your exposure significantly by having these masks and wearing them properly and trying to wear masks that really can do the job for you. And you know, some of the other things you know, worth, worth highlighting here before we get into questions, is you know there's there's some commercials out recently from uh, Health Canada and it shows um, you know some young people getting COVID, which is becoming a bigger issue, and that they show a nurse sitting on the floor exhausted, and you can see all these lines on her face, and so one of the things I can tell you for sure was when you're wearing a respirator or even a mask, there's two things that will make it work not work properly. One is it being too loose. And the other is it being too tight because people seem to think, well, the tighter I make it, the better it's gonna be. And that is not, not the, always the truth because what's gonna happen is it starts to buckle and things don't fit properly. You need to wear it as a manufacturer design. So you wanna get a nice comfortable fit, uh, but you don't want it to be too tight. You certainly don't want it, you know, if you take your, your respirator on or off or you take your, your face mask off, and there's lines on your face, I guarantee you're wearing it too tight and you're not getting the protection that you think you are. So I think we're ready for questions. Okay, thank you. To all three of us. Great, thank you, thank you. Just one question. Um, great presentation. Will the slide deck be available to all attendees? Yes, it will. We will be posting that on the website. Um, we are over time, so, I'm, so I do have a question, but I think I'm gonna, uh, gonna skip just to feedback. Um, thank you to all the attendees. Um, we'd like to hear your feedback. If you scan the QR code into your phone or camera, you'll be able to go straight to the survey. We use your survey uh, feedback to create future content for this series, so it's very valuable. Uh, thank you to the panelists, great presentations. You can contact them directly with any question you have. Contact myself with any issues around company outreach towards corporate social responsibility, where we can maybe help your not-for-profit more directly. Um, and last and by no means least, thank you to Kaylee Schwartz, Marie uh, Carvalho, who are at the back making these webinars happen so well and so seamlessly. So with that, I'd like to close. Thank you all for attending. Thank you to the presenters. Have a good and safe day. And uh, we'll see you next time we do a presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.